change. That's what we do and why we do it and how we do it. So our theme, as most of you know, is your joyous life for this whole year. And, you know, if some of you like uh, today and you think, oh my gosh, it's September, all of the talks are archived, pretty much. So you can go back if you want to do that. So we, uh, we are entering the last third of the year, so time to get your joy on, really. And, um, and I'm, uh, I want to frame what we do within the basic two lessons of Science of Mind, which I do often, and that because I think there's only two things that we do. One of the lessons that we work on here, uh, I term mastery, which is we like our life. We either learn how to create our life the way we love it, or how our life is, we learn how to love. And so we feel like we are in mastery with the creative law, that, that things aren't happening to us all the time, that we, they just send us into a tizzy, that we have some um, skill in working with the principles of life. So that's one thing. Then the other thing is oneness how we feel at one with our source, our good, each other. So that's, that's all there is. That's really pretty much all there is in life. So we've been working through this book, and we will continue this year, The Happiness Project. It's got 12 chapters in it. And most of the months, we have been working on mastery. Most of the months, we have some skills, um, practices, that you can do and that you can learn so that you like your life better. So just to review what we've covered so far, the topics have been um, our energy level, love, work, family, time, friendships, and money. And, and those are areas of our life where we can build some skills because the teaching is we can't actually change life, and we wouldn't want to. We work with the creative law to harmonize with it. And so the, the result is that we change. And as we change, life seems to change. So it's a, um, well, that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. There's no explaining it. It's, that's <laughs> the way it is. So last month we had a break from uh, the mastery part of the year and we had a month on eternity and how it feels to be a part of eternity. And that was really about the oneness part of our lesson, or our, our practice, our wisdom tradition. This month is about passion. And passion is kind of in the middle there. It's, it's like we are one with this urge within us to be and to create. And as we live, who we are, just like the song, then our life turns out to be great. So the, the author's passion in this book is actually books. She loves books. She loves reading. She loves writing. She loves sleeping with the books. I mean, that's what she does. And so, of course, what we are going to do is to generalize so that everybody can look at what their passion is because everybody's is different. That's, the, that's another part of how God made the world. Everybody's passion is different. And so it's really about divine expression. And it is about mastery. But it's not about what we have. It is about finding the pathway to express. So it's like mastering what we give to the world. Mastering our skill set that we give away again. So the theme is going to be this month. Your passion is your purpose. So being passionate with what you do in life is not about being the most effusive that you can be. I mean, I'm kind of an extrovert, and so I like am all over the place sometimes. But it's really about how aware we are of our heart and our desire to express in a particular way. Because there's a link, a very direct link, between what turns us on and what we should be doing in life. I'll say that again. There's a very direct link between what excites us, what turns us on, 
and what we should be doing in life. Because God planted in us those desires. The desires that we have are not in our heart to frustrate us. Our desires in our heart are to set a, an arrow uh, to what we should be doing, what we should be pursuing, what we should be thinking about, looking for, um, finding our pathway to serve within. So here's an example of that that came up on Susie Baldwin, who uh, often sings here. Um, posted this this morning. Oh, God. So my, I have a story about this, actually. Um, about, uh, now I have to find it again. Um, so this is a, an article that she, um, I have a story about my phone, is what I have. Um, so this is a, this is a, an article uh, that is, Dad finds a brilliant way to reuse leftover crayons from restaurants and schools. So this guy, Brian Ware, an inventive dad in San Francisco, has come up with a brilliant way to reuse leftover crayons that might get thrown out by restaurants and schools. So basically what he does in his kitchen, he puts plastic all over his kitchen and he melts the crayons color by color. And then he has a, a special uh, frame uh, that makes bigger crayons than usual. So he, he puts the melted crayon stuff into these forms, and what comes out are brand new crayons that are a little bit bigger. And then he gives these crayons, color by color by color, to hospitals. And what happens is that the children who are sick or have some sort of disability can hang on to the bigger crayons, and they get brand new crayons. And so he has, he has done thousands and thousands and thousands of boxes of crayons to hospitals um, for, for these little children that would have been thrown away and that have been thrown away for how many years? How many times have you gone to a restaurant and you've got a, you know, an inch long crayon and you know it's going to get tossed? So that is an example of how our passion actually is our purpose. You just, this guy was interested, he found a way, and now what great, great good is in the world because of him. So our goal this month is to pursue your passion. And here is this, I mean, I, this is it. This is the message of the whole month from Steve Jobs. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. Let's read that together. The only way to do great work is to love what you do. So that's it. That's what we're looking for today. So um, I want to draw your attention to this wonderful altar done by Sean because that red is absolutely the passion color. And so you just go up here after service and rub on this red if you want to get you know a little bit more oomph in your desires. So the title of my talk today, I love this image, is why do we get so excited anyway? Look how excited this guy is. He is on fire. He's on fire because he wants to take a picture of the lava or whatever. I mean, I, that's pretty amazing, don't you think? So the reason that we get excited is to give our life direction, to engage the creative process to send us in one direction and not another. So this next part was the, the kind of the undoing of me this morning because I wanted to share with you what I'm not excited about. You know, I'm not excited about cars so much. I mean, I, I need to drive, but I, I mean, I like my car, but I don't need a fancy car. I'm not into technology or sports, but it's the technology part that actually got me in trouble because what I am into is relationships and consciousness and ritual and stuff. So my phone decides to show me that the, the role that it plays in my life is not technology, it is relationship because it died. It died really dead and, and Mary, who's part of her passion is technology, made it live again. But then, <laughs> then what happened was, then what happened was that I was texting my son because he hasn't responded to my newsletter yet. 
So I'm saying, you're, you know, my best critic, you know, you haven't said anything about my newsletter yet. So he texts back and says, it's a very nice article. How do you get all the images or the pictures that you get? So I text back to him and I say, it's Google Images. The trick is you have to get the right category. I type this in. I see it. I send it. He texts back and says, the right cat shirt? So what, uh, what my phone had done after it had said the right word category was, yeah, it's Google Images and you have to get the right cat shirt. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just saying that I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so when we find our passion, when we find our passion, it usually is something that kind of continues pretty much throughout our life. So um, I'm, uh, I'm coming up to, I can't believe this, the 50th uh, anniversary of my high school graduation. And so I'm communicating with some people from high school that I haven't talked to since high school. And so this one guy that I had a crush on from fifth grade um, says, you know, here's my life story. Write, write your life story, you know, just here email me your life story. So what I'm passionate about, you know, is consciousness and ritual and sacred travel. And so I looked in my life as to where it was that I first got, got this fire. And some of you have heard this story that is in my 11th year. Uh, we moved out to the desert in Tucson, far, far away from my friends. And so um, my girlfriends had to be ferried uh, out to the desert. And so um, our moms helped in each direction. So we were out there with, a, I was there with a, two or three other 11-year-old girls, and we went on a hike down the road, and there was a cave, not a very big cave, but there was a cave that we went in. And so uh, we decided that we wanted to be a part of a secret society in this cave. And so what should we do to really initiate ourselves? And we decided that we were going to take off our shirts. So here we are, 11 years old, in the cave. Nothing really happened. I mean, no, nobody came and saw us. But if you can just get this, that this is my initiation into the ritual life, is 11-year-old girls in the cave, naked to the waist. And ever since then, ever since then, I have put myself into situations where ritual was required. So. I was in the, one of the Masonic orders for girls when I was a girl, and then I was in a sorority, and then I was the pledge trainer of the sorority. And let me tell you, there's all kinds of rituals involved with the pledge trainer of a sorority. So that was my initiation into ritual. So some of you might have heard those stories, but you haven't heard this one. This was about when I looked back and where was my first passion about sacred travel. So. It, and it involves my mom, and some of you love stories about my mom, Frank. It's almost October. Um, that's the holy month for uh, Frank because it's my mom's birthday month. He, she, he was, she was a teacher here for many, many years. So anyway, in my 20s, we actually had a, an idea that we were going to own a travel agency together. And, and I got the... Um, the learn by mail thing about how to be a travel agent, you know, and we looked at it. And as far as we got was kind of role playing um, the uh, agents, you know. So here we were, we were arm in arm with my mother and we were standing in front of a pretend client and we were saying, oh, you're planning a journey to Modesto. That's wonderful. <laughs> And we would just expand everybody's expectation about wonderful, wonderful travel. So. And I remember we actually did zero in on Modesto. So the idea is this. What you get most excited about points toward your purpose in life. And this is a photo of Special Olympics. There's a lot of passion involved in Special Olympics by the athletes, by the coaches. It's got to be a love thing for everybody. And so the idea is to really look in your heart as to what you love, what turns you on. So a lot of this um, has to do with how you were raised, 
how uh, your upbringing. So uh, we're going to talk now. The lesson slides are about the, the foundation for finding purpose. So you have something about that in your makeup, and it has to do with what you were told as a little one about your dreams. So you have a good foundation for finding your purpose if a few things. If, first of all, you were encouraged to get excited. If that's the first thing. If you were encouraged to get excited and if your parents got excited with you, uh, and if, you were, if your passion was not squelched, it, the truth is that not very many of us were told your interests are your personal guidance system to life. You should always do what you love, of course. You should lean into it. You should get passionate and really do it. You should get down and dirty and laugh and loud and do it. Not too many of us were told that. And it, it doesn't mean that, it just means that our parents were not encouraged to do that as well. Our parents were not told, be all you can be. You live your life and I'll live my life and, and just live out loud. They weren't told that. And so um, I think that there is a, that's one of those things that's passed on from generation to generation. And so if you look at the belief underneath uh, whether you got this foundation or whether you didn't, uh, if, you, if you were told to be quiet and to calm down and to not be too loud and to not be too boisterous, um, the, that message may come down to you in a belief system, and you know it is our belief system that makes our life what it is. Our life conforms to our deepest belief system. So a belief system for someone who was not encouraged to get excited could be something like, I can't take up too much room, I can't be too loud, I can't shine too brightly. You know, I can't tell you how many times I have counseled with people about, um, about their life path, and somehow they have it in them that they can't be more than their parents that they can't, some, they can't be happier than their parents, they can't be more fulfilled than their parents, they can't be more in love than their parents, they can't be you know, mentally and spiritually healthier than their parents. And so I've seen, I'm seeing some nods. And I want you to know that you can be. You can be miles ahead of your parents. So the belief that you could nurture and which you must nurture if you weren't delivered it in your childhood, is that I am a unique miracle in this amazing playground of earthly life. Just like we sang, it's in every one of us to be great and fabulous and wonderful and miraculous. We were constructed that way. Okay? So that's the first thing. If you... Uh, you have a good foundation for finding your purpose if you were encouraged to get excited. And the next is, if you were encouraged to follow your dreams. So, you live in a yes universe. And where we put our energy is magnified. Um, I don't know if my son, if my son had been raised by his grandparents if he would have turned into a musician. And honestly, I had a little bit of trouble okaying that he went to a music conservatory instead of a four-year college. But thank God I said, okay, okay, you're going to a conservatory. Because it's his, it's his passion. Opera conducting is his passion. And that is what he is doing. So, oh, thank God. Um, so, so uh, Henry David Thoreau said this, if one advances confidently in the direction of their dream, endeavoring to live the life they are imagining, one passes an invisible boundary. All sorts of things begin to occur that never otherwise would have occurred. 
one begins to meet with a success, unexpected, in common hours. What that means is that when we live our dreams, when we move in the direction of our dreams, when we do something every single day to move in the direction of our dreams, it literally feels like the universe shifts. And instead of offering us problems, it offers us solutions. And by accident, you run into somebody that is the perfect one for you. By accident, you uh, answer the phone at the exact right moment or make yourself available online at exactly the right moment. And there is a connection that is made and you look at it and you think, that, that is a chance in a million and it came right to me. That's what it means by um, more expansive laws take hold. The universe somehow knows, okay, this one's playing full out and we're gonna put all our gasoline on that flame because this one, this one is going to really make, make it good for everybody in life because that's what happens. When we live our purpose, it serves every single other person. So um, I, I got this book in the mail uh, recently, Vital Signs, The Nature and Nurture of Passion by Greg Lavoie. And in it, there is another quote from Thoreau that I want to share with you. Thoreau said that in wildness, not wilderness, is the preservation of the world. He didn't say wilderness because he didn't mean wilderness. He meant the breaking of rules, the insurgent life in the midst of your peers. Meaning this, Walden Pond is and was a mile from downtown Concord, and a train passes close by its shore to this day as it did in Thoreau's time. That nearness is the wild in it, to buck civilization right in its midst, to find a deep surge of nature right inside us. I think what this means is to live your passion right where you are. And you can have that wild feeling in the midst of civilization when you just say, okay, I am riding this one. This desire in me is exactly what my heart wants, and I am going to ride it to the finish to see what there is here for me. And, and you, you do kind of kick up some dust, and people kind of look at you like, what do you think you're doing? And the more people look at you and say, what do you think you're doing, and you do it, oh, um, recently somebody on Facebook wrote, those who say it can't be done should get out of the way of the people doing it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Really. So we're not really taught this because our parents weren't taught this. Uh, but I think that making a few waves is really good in life, and that's how evolution takes place for all of us. So the next is, you have a foundation for finding your purpose if you are encouraged to be satisfied with your efforts and results. So what this means is that do not be poisoned by perfectionism. Uh, if you are living your dream and getting excited and letting your life force follow this pattern, you will have results, and it may not be exactly the results that you're thinking of and exactly the timing that you're thinking of, but you will make progress, and the more you say, well, you know, it just uh, it wasn't what I was hoping for. Now, you know, I'm kind of disappointed in myself. That, that just, that, you know, those unseen hands in the creative law that are saying, okay, we're making the dream, making the dream, making the dream, making the dream. And as if you say, mm, well, you know, I, I, I'm disappointed in my results. Then the unseen hands go, oh, okay. And they just drop what they're making for you. So um, another uh, story here from Greg Lavoie involves Scheherazade. Now, you, you remember who Scheherazade was. Scheherazade uh, became a wife of a sultan of Persia who was very, very uh, challenged with intimacy because he, um, he, he married uh, 
he married a wife in the evening and had his way with her. And then I don't know what he was afraid of. I'm sure something. But uh, because he killed her in the morning, you know, so over and over and over. And, and because he was the sultan, you know, they couldn't say, mm, no, thank you. They, uh, oh, okay. So Scheherazade started a story. And she ended the, or she didn't end the story. It came to the crisis right at sunrise. And so the sultan let her live because he wanted to see how the story ended. And so the next night she ended the story, but there was something else that happened. And so she, you know, once again, sunrise right at the climax of the story, and the sultan goes, OK, I got to see what happens here. Well, this went on for a thousand and one nights and a thousand and one stories. Oh, poor woman. And, um, <laughs> And after that, the sultan uh, fell in love with Scheherazade, and the killing stopped. Oh, my God. So this is, the, this is the meaning of that, though. Scheherazade reminds us that the commitment to forward momentum is a life-saving virtue, and that it's critical not to fall too far out of sync with life, which moves. That is, if we stop telling our stories, we're dead. If we stop the narrative from moving forward, stop doing the life-giving thing, stop doing what Scheherazade's storytelling ultimately did, create passion where there wasn't any, we're dead in a soul sense. So that is be satisfied with your efforts and results and keep on going. Then next is encourage others. There's no competition. Nobody has your dream. Nobody has the fire in your belly to do what you have to do. It might look like you're both after the same job, but if the other person gets it, that wasn't your job. You know, I, I had a, a great consciousness when I, when I moved from my first career to my second career. My first career was high school teaching, which didn't last too long, and my second career was um, in college textbook sales. In that summer between when I finished my last high school year and took a job in my first publishing company, I interviewed with so many unrelated industries that I literally had a, uh, an alphabetized notebook of everybody that I had interviewed with. And when they hired somebody else, consistently I would say, well, they don't get me. And I was off. I was off to something else. I said that, you know, 40 times. Oh, well, they don't get me. And, and it's true. It's absolutely true. And, and in, the, in the course of things, I interviewed for more than one publisher. And the first few didn't hire me, and then the last one did. And those other ones didn't get me. So when we encourage others, we have the knowledge of what Hafiz says. This place where you are right now, God circled on a map for you. You can't be in your wrong place. So, here's the deal. If you were not encouraged to get excited, follow your dreams, be satisfied with your efforts and results, and to encourage others, you have to do it for yourself. And that's how we do every single shift of consciousness. We do it for ourselves. And that you, these, these are the steps in nurturing that fire in your belly. Because when you do this, you can literally have, have it all. You can have your dream. You can have your contribution in life. You can have your reward from doing your dream. You can all of it. It's fabulous. So I'm, I'm going to bring up Bodhi now because Bodhi is living his dream. And he's going to speak for two or three minutes about living his dream. Thank you. This was kind of last minute, so I had to take notes. And it's interesting, I got a birthday card today from James and Elizabeth, which was very cool because they thought it was my birthday, but it, it, it actually is just a rebirth of my artistic soul. So they knew that kind of intuitively. So it's not really, my birthday's in March, but 
I am being reborn as an artist because I, I, I'm recreating all these things that are happening. I have a passion. When I was in the fourth grade, I went to my friend's house who was playing trumpet, and he was playing trumpet. We sat on his bed, I remember, and I said, oh, I have to play the trumpet. This is amazing. So I got a trumpet. I went every Saturday down to Oakland, took a bus down to Oakland for best music trumpet lessons for eight years, and that's why I can play the conch shell. <laughs> I studied eight years to be able to play the conch shell at church. And then I took up the piano and I played the accordion for two years. Uh, and I just, my parents really encouraged me to play music, my father especially. And my father and my grandfather, his father-in-law, did not get along so well. But uh, my, and so they kind of were at odds. It was perfect because my father was with me more often. He encouraged me in my art. And my grandfather was saying, you need to be an engineer. Music's a nice hobby, but uh, uh, engineering is a much more stable profession. But anyway, I had this, this, this vision a couple days ago about the shadow side of creativity. And there's like a mirror, like for every tree that grows, there's a huge root system. And there's always a mirror, and there's always the other side, you know, of, of uh, the root of creativity. Because I have this very dark side, this very dark cave that I live in sometimes. And I get really scared, and I get anxious, and I go, what am I doing with my life? Why am I doing this? It's been such a struggle. It's been so hard to make it, so to speak, as an artist. And so every artist, every passion, I think, has this... You have to not be afraid of this dark side of your passion. As you all know, there's every, every energy has like some darkness in it as well because it's all mixed. And so to be able to go into that darkness and to find the visions that come out. Some of these visions that come out of this darkness are quite amazing. They, they break the rules as they're wild. They're completely wild. I mean, I, I go out into the woods regularly and get really wild to blow off steam because civilization is like uh, difficult for me. So anyway, uh, that's really cool. I just wanted to share about that being part of your passion. The, the mirror, it's like looking in the mirror. I spent a lot of time looking in the mirror, practicing loving myself and practicing my technique on my instruments for a long time, just getting the flute embouchure just right. It took a long time to get that flute embouchure just right. And there was a picture I couldn't see. How do I, well, I look in the mirror and I saw it and I matched the picture I'm supposed to do and I finally got it. So look in the mirror sometimes and ask yourself, really look in the mirror, look in your own eyes, just like you would look in somebody else's eyes and honor them. Look in the mirror and honor yourself and then you'll get some amazing feelings inside that will just un uncover some of that passion. So yeah, my dad supported me, uh, what you meant to doing, and so I'm having a rebirth, and that's really good. Uh, so that's enough, thank you. <laughs> Um, so the conclusion to my part of the talk is, uh, I hope, a gift for Bodhi and for all of you artists, and actually for all of us, because the Senate of the United States has done something fabulous. The National Association for Music Education is deeply pleased with this afternoon's development that the United States Senate has passed its bipartisan Elementary and Secondary Education Act reauthorization proposal, the Every Child Achieves Act, by a final vote of 81 to 17. The Senate's action today is an important step toward ensuring that all students, regardless of their socioeconomic status, experience the demonstrable positive impact that music education has on learning and life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So music and arts, according to the Senate, is now back in core curriculum. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Woohoo! So we can have more of our little pumpkins following their passion for music and art. I know, it's so great. So with that, you're going deeper is, this is what I want for us all, everything I put my energy to excites me. Everything I put my energy to excites me. I don't, I don't know what happened. You got so excited. I did. Just, just, yeah. 
desk too. Okay. Something's feeding. I back. know. It's uh, we all got excited. The energy in the whole room just <laughs> raised. Well, it's like a dog whistle. So, inner work now. Inner work, people. As we sink deeply within to that place where passion and poise and possibility and purpose are all the same. I ask each one of us to travel back into our lives and get in touch with something that we are passionate about or that we were passionate about. And even if this is a journey that is only 15 minutes old because you're already there, or decades old because you haven't visited this passion in so long, it's easy to arrive there because we all have an interest, a passion that is planted there. And no matter if this passion brings up joy or regret or whatever the emotion is, let the desire to express that deepen right now. Just for a moment, Allow your heart to say, I want this so much. I want to express this so much. And then the only other work to do in this moment is to say, I am willing for the universe to support me in this expression. I'm just willing. And so knowing that dreams right now are being reignited, those little shoots are green and growing, I give my thanks for all of this. Every single step along the path, no time has been wasted. A dream can be taken up in this instant. I give my thanks for this, and I know it is so, and so it is. Amen.